Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome back to our lecture series in advanced political economy. This um, project is, again, an, a project that is an interaction between the New School and SOAS, and our goal is to um, in, initiate a conversation to build a community of scholars who think about political economy through a critical uh, lens that is based on a Marxian tradition. We are here today for our second class, uh, our, sectors, our second lecture series, to discuss about methodology of economics. Now, um, we have with us um, Richard Wolf, Professor Richard Wolf, who is uh, one of the prominent scholars in methodology of economics and a, a real activist. Before though introducing him properly, um, I would like to just say a couple of words about why um, start our second lecture with the topic of methodology. First of all, what is methodology? Well, methodology, uh, broadly speaking, can be understood as the sphere that problematizes the lens through which one understands the world. In our case, the socioeconomic world. So methodology is thus concerned with the ontological question. So what nature, of what nature are the objects that make up the universe we see and describe? and with the so-called epistemological question, the conception of the nature and limits of our knowledge. Now, in a Marxian perspective, method is key and foundational to all theory. In other words, you cannot really do economic theory without thinking about method. That is without problematizing why we think the way we think and the categories we use to, um, think about the world we're in. Now, this is in fact why, if you think about our past class, which was um, taught by Professor Costas Lapavitsas, his very introduction of what is political economy was all already a methodological discussion. He went through topics such as the relation between the concrete and the abstract, the simple and the complex, the historic and the logic. So we see that imbued in the very even definition of what political economy is, we are discussing fundamentally methodology and method. And this is of course also why Marx's great works was understood as a critique to political economy. By contrast, um, it is the case that mainstream uh, economics thinks rarely about method. Uh, if you're an economics student, you rarely do take classes in methodology. And when you do, it's usually understood in a very narrow way as fundamentally the toolkit of, of the economist. Um, why is that? Well, in a Marxian perspective, we can actually understand the reason for mainstream economics as not pondering upon the basis of their knowledge as part of actually why intellectuals in their scientific and academic activity play a role of actually strengthening capitalist institutions. So fundamentally by not explaining what needs to be explained and by instead concealing, for example, exploitation as the source of value, this actually helps preserve the status quo and preserve the general acceptance, passive acceptance for the society we live in. Instead, in a Marxian framework, we believe that not only method is, is central, but that actually method, the method adopted by the sciences is a crucial element of the very class struggle, right? So you have the choice of deciding what method to use, whether a method that ultimately conceals instead of explaining, or a method that is intrinsically revolutionary. In a sense, Marxian analysis is intrinsically revolutionary because in the very explanation, the um, urge to action emerges, right? So in the very moment in which we theorize, action emerges. And this is why we have Richard Wolff here with us, who really embodies this deep interconnection between theory and activism. Um, I would just like to say one more um, 
one more small thought just to contextualize what we're doing here is that clearly there is no monolithic answer to what constitutes a Marxist methodology, right? There are different scholars who embody the Marxian tradition differently. And if you guys even think about the classic little booklet by Perry Anderson called Considerations on Western Marxism, Perry makes it very clear that different contexts and different historical moments have brought about different ways of understanding the Marxian tradition in economics and philosophy and spurred different directions in which to understand methodology. So today with us, we have Richard Wolff, as I said, who not only is a great scholar of methodology, and you can just even think about his one of his classic books called Knowledge and Class that you guys had as one of the readings for this week, um, but also someone who clearly really embodies, I think, what is the kernel of a Marxian methodology, which is the intrinsic relation between theory and practice. As Gramsci would put it, action is thought and thought is action. So the fact that theory and practice reciprocally inform and strengthen one another and thus reinforce the transformative dynamics that are already underway. Wolf is uh, has a PhD from Yale uh, University. He has been he's an emeritus professor from UMass Amherst. He worked there for many years, from 1973 to 2008, and now he has been at the New School for a while. So we're very honored to have him at the New School with us. And uh, Richard Wolf is not only the author of more than 15 amazing books that are actually addressed to a variety of different audiences. He's also the founder of the journal Rethinking Marxism, and even more importantly for, for us in this community is that he has been, uh, he co-founded also the nonprofit uh, called Democracy at Work, in which every Monday he broadcasts, and I'm sure uh, I'm not saying anything that you guys don't know, he broadcasts an economic update that actually reaches millions of families in the United States and not only. So in a way, Richard has been able fundamentally to transform his theoretical work in direct conversation with a broad audience. And this is something that really is unique. And this is why he is one of the strongest and most, and most um, incisive voices in the United States today, and certainly in the Marxian tradition. So thank you, Richard, for being with us. The floor is yours. Um, he will give a lecture of around 40 to 15 minutes, and then we will have the time for our students to join us uh, in a conversation with Richard. Okay, thank you very, that's a very generous introduction, uh, Professor uh, Matei, and I am uh, grateful for the invitation as well as the introduction. Indeed, the introduction is doubly useful to me because it saves me time. Uh, I don't have to say things you've already explained in your introduction and with which I agree. Um, so I'll try to make this a mix of personal and professional since I'm assuming you might be interested uh, in both. I've been a, you know, a professor of economics all my adult life. Um, and uh, here in the United States where I was born, uh, although both my parents were immigrants uh, and not of the United States. Um, so I've had a, one leg in Europe and one leg in the United States most of my life. Uh, I'm a product of the elite universities of the United States. Uh, partly as an immigrant's child, I was encouraged by my parents uh, to do whatever was necessary to rise up in this society from the impoverished condition that they, as refugees, um, had to live with. Um, and throughout my time at, at Harvard and Stanford and Yale, uh, the only institutions I attended, um, every effort was made by very good professors uh, to persuade me away from the left-wing ideas that I had already formed uh, crudely as a high school student but I want to credit them for having worked very, very hard uh, to persuade me uh, that capitalism really is the best thing that has ever happened to the human race and beyond which there is no point 
in aiming because there isn't anything there. They tried very hard. They used every argument. It is not their fault that they failed. Uh, they couldn't prevent it. I became a Marxist. And in case any of you are wondering, I proudly accept the label now. Uh, if anything, I'm more Marxist than I was earlier in my life, since so many of the things that I have witnessed have reinforced that way of thinking. Uh, that's the first. The second, I understand that I am an uh, unusual character here in the American economics firmament, uh, but I wanna explain that in a way perhaps you haven't heard. Uh, economics was, before the Second World War, a quite open and large social science here in the United States. After World War II, uh, it wasn't anymore. It became very narrow, very carefully focused in particular ways that excluded many of the broader concerns that were normal to economy and economics before World War II. And three things in particular I would draw your attention to. Number one, the economics profession understood right away after World War II that where the money was in the university was in the natural sciences, that what was considered ephemeral, temporary, marginal, were things like philosophy or anthropology or language or a whole lot of other subjects like that. But what were really important were the biological, physical, mathematical, and so on, the natural sciences. That's where I come from, the natural sciences. So economics was eager for people like me. And one of the ways you showed the rest of the world how really scientific you were was by introducing and then integrating as much mathematics into your economics as you possibly could. For those of us who come from e mathematics, uh, this was all rather childish. But for those unfamiliar with mathematics, the language had, uh, of mathematics had an almost magical ability to make you seem to be much deeper in what you understood than you actually were. The second thing after World War II that shaped modern economics was the Cold War. The need to demonstrate that not only were you scientific, and therefore narrowly focused on economics almost as a kind of engineering, but you also had to demonstrate your absolute loyalty, which meant that anything having to do with socialism, communism, Marxism, would be better off kept off the shelf of the library in your office and kept out of your writing and out of your lectures. You didn't want to get into a situation where you were asked awkward questions because no matter what you answered, your very engagement with the Marxian tradition was um, uh, suspect. And finally, you participated after World War II, whether you liked it or not, in the overwhelmingly dominant agenda of Should both be. the business community and the government. And that was to roll back to undo the social democratic New Deal that had been created in the United States in the 1930s and early 40s by the president of the time, Franklin Roosevelt, but only because he was under extraordinary pressure from a very well-developed American left characterized by four constituent organizations. The CIO, the greatest unionization drive in American history, number one. Number two, two different socialist parties. And number three, the American Communist Party, who all worked together to produce uh, a kind of social democracy here in the United States during the 1930s and early 40s. The business community and the government it controlled devoted themselves after the war to rolling all that back. Therefore, when you talk about mainstream economics and what it is and how it's different from Marxian, 
please keep in mind those three formative influences to be scientific or pseudoscientific, or at least in form scientific, which meant in practice mathematical, to be on the right side of the Cold War and to not get in the way of the movement to undo the New Deal. In the, under those conditions, uh, people like me, young people coming up in the American uh, university system, were quickly made aware of what it was and what it was not cool to do, to say, and to be. Uh, I learned early on that knowing mathematics was a definite advantage to me, and it helped me through a number of what might have been otherwise difficult uh, situations. And likewise, going to the elite universities, for those of you that have not yet learned that lesson, this is a country here, the United States, that is slavishly subordinating itself to the mysticism of these universities as if something extraordinary happens there that doesn't happen elsewhere. I spent 10 years of my life looking for whatever that extraordinary was. I didn't find it then, and I've never found it since either. I also learned that what interested me most about economics was no longer fashionable. It was like having the wrong hemline or having the wrong color combination in your outfits. It was, for example, very uncool to be interested in methodology. Um, as Professor Matai said, and she's quite right about that, uh, you will look far and wide in graduate programs and economics in this country for courses in methodology, let alone uh, taking that subject seriously. If it's treated at all, it's treated dismissively as if somehow we all know what the methodology of social science is, or as if we all agree on what that is, which has never been true, or or it's treated in that dismissive way with which we treat mostly courses in the history of economic thought, a kind of uh, un untasty medicine you need to take. Don't take it too seriously. Don't spend a lot of time, but it is something we go through. In a Marxist tradition out of which I come, none of that kind of procedure is possible. For us, and I'm, I'm speaking only for myself now, uh, but I'll be glad to tell you about others who are similar if, if you'd like to pursue that later on. But for us, the methodology is absolutely crucial, but not crucial in some formalistic sense, but crucial in a very commonsensical way. Uh, and so let, let me give you a, a simple example. When you look at the world, you have a lens or a framework through which you do that looking. If you're an astronomer, you use a telescope. If you are an economist, you use a framework that guides what you look at and how you put together the different things you see. But as you do that, you're using your eyes, you're using your brain to process the information your eyes are receiving, and you're also using your brain to organize the thoughts that are stimulated by what your eyes are able to see. And we don't all do that in the same way, which means that what we see how we see, what we do with what we see and how we see differs from one of us to another. And the reason, the way to put it one way, has been developed by scholars over hundreds of years into a discipline called, if you like, the philosophy of science or the theory of knowledge or epistemology, a lot of words that cover this area. Since anybody who thinks about anything concretely, like an economist about the economy, is doing theory, is seeing things, 
taking things in through the five senses, processing them with one's brain, and then organizing what one has processed. Since economists are doing that, they are therefore subject to knowing and using what the field of philosophy or theory of science has been doing for hundreds of years. One of the seminal contributions in modern thinking about what we're doing when we're thinking was the teacher of Karl Marx, namely the German philosopher Hegel, an absolutely towering intellectual not only in his own time, but in everything that has happened in the realm of thought, theory, epistemology, economics, history, ever since. Therefore, one of the places Marx started, and one of the places those of us started for whom the question, what is theory and how do you do it, was important, was with Hegel and with his uh, processing by Marx. And we drew from that also what other people had done along the way in struggling with how to understand theory before you jump in and do some theory, some particular theoretical work. You worry about what it is you're doing. It's a little bit like, if you allow me, a carpenter worrying about before he or she gets busy with the wood, learning about the drill and the saw and what's exactly done and not done, intended and unintended when one uses these tools in this way toward this project. Who are the major influences? If I had time, you know, that's what I teach. I would talk to you about Hegel. That's right. Economic students would have to read some Hegel and learn about that because it's immediately relevant. But here are some others you might not have thought about. You'd have to read Sigmund Freud. One of the reasons is Freud, in his own way, stumbled upon and made use of radically different ways of theorizing. So he didn't just come up with new objects of theory, like the unconscious or the semi-conscious. It's also that he developed a whole new way of thinking about what the analysis of a topic like, I'll pick the key one, dreams is all about. So here's what he came up with. I could use half a dozen others, Bachelard in France, Congi Lem in France, the history of linguistics in, in uh, modern linguistics, de Saussure, the Marxist Louis Althusser, there's quite a few, Lukács in his way, Gramsci in another way. But I'm going to stay with Freud. Freud asks, what's a dream? And he did a whole book, his first famous book, the interpretation of dreams, and he asked the question. And here's the interesting thing. There was, no, make a long story short, there was no cause of the dream. There was no way, and he tried them all, to argue that here was the cause and here was the effect, the dream. He came up, by the way, his word, with the idea that what happens in a dream the thing you recount to a therapist when describing the dream you remember is in fact not caused by any one of the infinity of experiences your five senses had in the previous days and weeks, nor the millions of mental processes you did on that sensory data in the previous weeks and days. In fact, everything that happened to you plays its unique role in shaping each instant of your dream. Your dream isn't determined by any particular experience. It is rather overdetermined by all of them. Once you you have this thought, 
you have just stumbled upon or reasoned your way to recognizing, even if it's only for an instant, that the tradition of analysis that says I can explain an event, any event, a rising interest rate, a falling exchange rate, an economic growth rate, anything, to explain it requires you to analyze all of its over-determinants. No one or two or five or six privileged, say, in an econometric equation. No, 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 no. It's everything. And precisely because it's everything, you cannot account for it because you cannot account for everything. If you were to look to list all the items that cause anything, you would die of old age before you listed them, let alone measured what influence each one had. And since they all influence one another, it is an explanatory impossibility. Well, then what is what is explanation, if we're even going to be allowed to use the term? Well, here we go. Here's now where an ontological notion, the world is overdetermined. Everything that happens is shaped by everything else and participates in its own way in shaping everything else. Once you realize that, then you become epistemologically aware that everything that has ever passed for explanation is only partial. It's what an individual or a group of individual or a whole community of individuals have decided are those influences they are going to take seriously, they are going to acknowledge, they are going to measure, and how those influence the outcome implicitly, if they're not aware, explicitly if they are, they have excluded a vast array of other possible influences, which overdetermination says aren't just possible, but are there. And of course, there is no defense. I'm looking at the key ones, because the only way you'd know that they were key is if you had compared them to all the others, and that's what you can't do. So you didn't do that. There is another reason why you think something is key, but it's not because you've understood and compared the variables you focus on to those others that you don't. Even more crucial, we focus differently depending on who we are and where we sit in a society. And here comes Marxism. Marxism is not conventional economics. To be crude, Smith and Ricardo welcomed capitalism, celebrated it. It was the new, the emergent, the efficient, the sexy emergence out of feudalism. Feudalism was the old, the decrepit, the dying. Capitalism could promise the world. It did. The devotees of capitalism became the celebrants of liberty, equality, and fraternity in France and democracy here in the U.S. Capitalism was going to bring all those things. And the devotees of capitalism still think they will. And those that are really far gone think they already have and that we have all those things, liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. But Marxists don't. In Marxism, the idea is, oh, no, no. We are different. We think capitalism promised what it failed to deliver. Capitalism promised liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy, but hasn't given us any of them and indicates no intent of doing that these days, if anything, going the other way. And so Marxism is a critical perspective. And as such, 
found a way to focus on certain parts of the story of capitalism that were, should surprise no one, different from the parts that Smith, Ricardo, and the countless defenders of capitalism have found ever since. Marxists know that they have a particular perspective. They know that the neoclassicals do too, and the Keynesians do as well, and everybody else you might list likewise. And so the Marxists, unlike the others, have to admit that, of course, their truths, their analytics are based on some entry points, some starting notions. The starting notion isn't the individual, and it isn't the entrepreneur, and it isn't the market. The entry point is this thing which the others didn't see. Marx was quite clear. That's what he focused on, in part because the others didn't see it. His focus is on the production and distribution of a surplus. Others either didn't see it at all, or others didn't see it as the important topic he, Marx, could devote a lifetime to figuring out and explaining to us and working out its implications. Not preferences, not technology, not endowments of wealth. No, no, something else was the entry point for Marx, and it was class. And this class introduction was not only the peculiar perspective through which the lens through which a Marxist critique of capitalism was constructed, more complicated, because it turns out Marx's notion of class in terms of the production and distribution of surplus was radically new and different from pre-existing concepts of class. And here again, the epistemology becomes important. Class is a word that has been used to mean very different things. And that's not unusual in human history. I'm sure many of you discovered when you were younger or maybe now that there are other important words in life that are just understood differently by different people. And you will save yourself a great deal of grief if you know that. If you use the word love loosely, you're going to encounter difficulty as you discover that other people mean something different from what you do when they use that word. And that's true of many things. Long before Marx, there were concepts of class. And remember, a concept of class comes from the verb to classify. Human beings have been classifying their own communities for thousands of years. And one of the classifications, the division of the people in the community into different groups, did this differentiation around what people did or did not own. In other words, class as the rich versus the poor. And of course, with all such dichotomies, the middle. And for thousands of years, other people used the word class in still another way. It was who had the power and who didn't, who gave orders and who took them. Class as power, class as property, concepts used by Marx, but not the contribution from Marx. We don't need Marx for those contributions. They long predate him. But the notion that all the human efforts to overcome the inequalities of wealth and power by concepts such as equality or concepts such as democracy, which are about equalization of the distributions of wealth and power, the failure of the human community to overcome that in modern history takes Marx to ask and answer the question, could they have missed something? Is there a way of understanding society they didn't have, which had they had it, 
might have allowed them to make the changes that could have achieved what they did after all promise, liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy. And Marx's answer was yes. What they failed to see, and what I'm gonna make as the vantage point, the perspective of doing economics, is I'm gonna ask the question, is there surplus being produced? If so, by whom, how, where, when, and who gets the surplus, and what do they do with that surplus? Maybe I can understand something about society if I ask that question systematically and work out the answers. In my reading of Capital, volumes one, two, and three, that's what those volumes are about. Volume one is devoted to identifying how, where, when surplus is produced by this group of people, people he calls productive laborers, appropriated by a different group of people, capitalists, and in particular, industrial capitalists, who then distribute that surplus to yet another group of people who are mostly neither productive workers nor themselves industrial capitalists. In volumes two, he look, looks at how the output produced by capitalists and productive laborers circulates. And then he disaggregates it. How does the surplus move around as opposed to the other part of the output that isn't the surplus? And then in volume three, he talks about all the distributions of the surplus, the portions that industrial capitalists distribute to money lending capitalists, what we nowadays call bankers, or to merchants, the Walmarts of our time and to all the other social groups that live by getting a distribution from the appropriator of the surplus in return for doing something for that appropriator. All that's worked out for us in a wonderfully developed way in those three volumes of capital. And they end up giving us an apparatus things to be fixed that don't work, contradictions to be identified and overcome, new contradictions discovered in the process. But it's a project of looking at capitalism from the perspective of a critic who thinks we can and should go beyond capitalism, but who now has an apparatus for understanding what we need to go about beyond that is based on a critical insight taken from Marx, which is why we call it Marxism. Okay, in the interest of time, let me then jump. Where are we now in the Marxist economics uh, process? Well, we're in a peculiar moment. You may have noticed that. Uh, old systems are in the process of dying. New ones are in the process of emerging. The Marxism, which in the, eight, in the 1990s and the early years of this century was pronounced dead and gone, has once again done its rebirth piece of theater, reminding us of Mark Twain's reaction when he read his own obituary in the Hartford newspaper and he wrote to the editor, uh, quote, uh, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated and signed it Mark Twain. Uh, Marxists could do that too. Uh, everybody told me at that time that continuing in the Marxist project was a poor career move and would make me fall to the wayside, irrelevant to anybody but a few people even older than I am. Uh, didn't turn out to be correct, but it hasn't been correct every other time it's been announced either. Well, we've had some amazing 
events in the last hundred years. And they, I think, are fitting as a way to describe where Marxism is now and where the approach that is epistemologically and ontologically self-aware, as I've tried to show it, where it leads us. The first thing was the collapse of the Soviet Union and of the Eastern European socialist efforts. What that did is shock Marxists into a recognition, which some of them had had, but many of them missed, that social systems don't go out of existence or new ones come in in some nice, clean end of the period A, arrival of the period B. If anything, the history of capitalism's emergence from feudalism in Europe should have forewarned Marxists. There were many towns, cities, regions where capitalist relationships, that is employer-employee, replaced feudal or slave relationships, lord, serf, master, slave, that lasted a few weeks, a few months, a few years before they collapsed in on themselves or were overthrown by the feudal predecessors that didn't want a new system to arrive. It took a long time of learning from the early experiments of capitalism, what were the conditions necessary to enable a transition from Lord Surf to employer employee to survive, to grow and to finally become the prevailing new system that feudalism had been when it emerged out of the slavery of a collapsing Roman empire, et cetera. Russia and China, Cuba, North Vietnam, and all the rest were and are experiments, the early experiments. The earliest one that Marx himself wrote about, the Paris Commune. Whose, whose duration was measured in weeks. Russia, Soviet Union, measured in decades. China, well, we're still measuring. And all of them made enormous errors, like those Marx identified in the Paris Commune, that had a lot to do with their implosion, those that are gone, and their difficulties, those that aren't. But they were trial and errors accumulating the insights that would try to figure out what combination of the experiences of the past work would sustain. What are the things that were done by the early experiments that are foundations to build on? And what were the things that were done that are things to never do again? And that process of learning is going on, but it's far from resolved. Then there was the second aspect of the collapse of the Soviet Union and of what has in fact happened in the People's Republic of China and so on. And that was the recognition that Marxists have some self-criticism to do. And it involved a going back to the roots of the Marxian tradition to see whether there were clues there to explain what was wrong with Marxism now, what might need to be changed, elaborated, adjusted. Marx himself had always said that the process is never ending, and so it should never have ended. And much of the return that rediscovered epistemology, ontology, the Hegelian legacy, the all of this material under the heading overdetermination, and so on. That was partly an effort to go back to foundations and rethink the Marxian tradition. And here's what that came up with, again, to make a proverbial long story short. The mistake was to borrow too much from the non-Marxian tradition. In the non-Marxian tradition, one of the oldest and by now the stalest debates imaginable is the debate over whether there should be more or less state intervention 
in the private capitalist economy. That debate, which entrances generation after generation of people uh, who work in and on and for capitalism, had become important for Marxists too. For many of them, socialism was what the government would do. It would regulate way more than in private capitalism was the norm. It would even go so far as to become itself, as in the Soviet Union, the owner operator of enterprises producing commodities. How much that was a good thing or a bad thing was debated by Marxists almost as much as by the usual Keynesian versus neoclassical or yet other forms of that endless debate. But then Mar Marxists came up with one of those foundational questions. Maybe that debate is theirs, the, cap the people who like capitalism who care about it, preserving it, saving it, building it, defending it. But it shouldn't be ours. That's not our project. That's not Marx's project. There might be a reason Marx didn't think much about writing about the state, left it till he never got to it. Well, what might that entail? And then the kind of eureka moment. Where in Marxism, is there an appropriate microeconomics to match, to coordinate with, to meld with a macro? Marxism is full of macro, full of what the government can do, should do, might do, all the th theories of planning, all the theories of planning and markets and all of that. But where is the analytics of the workplace? of the interaction of human beings with one another and with nature that comprises what we call the locus of production, the workplace. And the recognition dawned on Marxists. We've let that go. We've let it go as though it were a technical matter, how people interact in a factory, an office, or a store, as if it were somehow built in to modern history. But it isn't. It never was. In fact, if you go back to Capital in Volume 1, even, it's a detailed analysis of the interaction between employer and employee. The employer exploits the employee. And that's not a matter of treating people nicely or not. It has to do with a structural relationship that the enterprise embodies and enforces. And why haven't we gone after that? Why haven't we not only analyzed it a lot more than we actually have, but why haven't we focused on the difference between how it ought to be and how in capitalism it is? And you know, as Einstein taught, the trick is never the answer. The trick is the question. Once you have the question, that tells you, now where do you have to go to get the answer? But the real creative moment is the recognition of the right question to ask. And once that question was asked, here comes the conclusion. Modern history of economies focuses particularly, not exclusively, but particularly on slavery, feudalism, and capitalism. That has a lot to do with Eurocentrism, of course, but it'll suffice for the moment. Slavery is the relationship in the workplace between master and slave. Feudalism is the relationship in the workplace between lord and serf. And capitalism is the relationship in the workplace between employer and employee. Don't miss the parallels. What the Marxist critique is, 
precisely if you don't miss the parallels, then what socialism means is the end of any such dichotomy. No master over the slave, no lord over the serf, and none of the modern incarnations of that dichotomy, which we call capitalism with the employer and the employee. In all those cases, a tiny group of people run the enterprise at the stop, at the top. They have the dominant wealth, which accumulates in their hands and which they give to themselves. Literally, as a corporation provides its top executives with uh, pay packages and its major shareholders with their dividends. They have the power, and because they concentrate the wealth and power, they have to make sure that if there is universal suffrage, it is encapsulated within a political system that keeps all the power where it originates, at the top, in the hands of the capitalist employer, just as it did in the feudal lords and it did in the slaves masters. It means that the revolution beyond capitalism has to do what it did not understand before. Whatever the global, the macro transformations, private property into collective property, markets into planning plus market, whatever the concatenation of macro changes, the Marxian contribution is to recognize the need for and the nature of the micro level transformation. No more employer versus employee. That's done. That's finished. What comes now is what is called around the world a variety of names here in the United States, for lack of something better, worker co-op will do. It's when the workers become their own employers, when the dichotomy is broken, when the worker, all workers will have two job descriptions. One, the particular task they do, and the other one, their participation in running the enterprise, designing it, adjusting it, determining where the collectively produced surplus will be distributed. That's the argument. And it connects the, the most basic epistemological and philosophical roots right up to the most urgent for today demand of a political revolution. Capitalism, and I'll conclude with this. Capitalism is in the worst shape that I have seen it in my lifetime. And I want to end with a story about that. Um, when I got my PhD at Yale, um, one of my classmates who took the same courses I did, uh, the same exams I did, had the same lectures in the same room from the same professor I did, uh, was a woman named Janet Yellen. We come out of the exact same time, place, and education. Um, she went on to be what you all know her to be. I assume you do. Um, I didn't. Um, I get together with people like her, not her. I'm not personally uh, friends with her. But I went through the same school. I know many of those people. And I have coffee or beer with them from time to time. You might be interested to know that over the last 12 to 18 months, our occasional get togethers have resulted in the following experience. We do not agree on how the United States capitalist system got itself into the current situation it's in. And we do not agree on what to do about it or where it's going to go next. But on the sentence, 
this is the worst condition of American capitalism in my lifetime. To our amazement, we all agree. We all agree. And I think that tells you something. Capitalism is a system that has always been full of contradictions. Well, that should surprise no one, especially not someone who understands that another way to describe the overdetermination of everything by everything else is to say that therefore everything in it has the pushes and pulls from all the different directions that impact it and is therefore full of those contradictory impulses. Capitalism likewise, like every other system, has had people who love it from the beginning and people who don't from the beginning. It cannot do otherwise. Its contradictions guarantee that mixture, as it has been true of every other system. And the result of the contradictions produces in every economic system something very similar to what it produces in every living being birth, evolution, and then death. Capitalism was born, we kind of know, several centuries ago, at least the modern form, in England and then spread to become the globally dominant system. So it's had several years of evolution following its birth. What that means is that the next phase is its death. It's really not a question of whether, it's mostly a question of exactly how and where and when. Right now, what seems to be happening is that the old centers and the old leaders of capitalism are dying. More than a queen was buried in England a few weeks ago as everything that has happened since attests. The United States cannot wield the political and economic power it once could, and no amount of denial will make all of that go away. The new centers of capitalism are in the East, and I'm sure you don't need me to tell you where they are. The critique of capitalism, therefore, is having an extraordinary renaissance right now, right here in Western Europe, in North America, but in many other parts of the world as well. I do more public speaking as one voice, just one of this renaissance. I do more public speaking in a month now than I did in any 10 year period before 2008. Being a Marxist now intrigues Americans where they once ran away. It's an extraordinary time. And what the country wants and needs and does not have enough of are people able to bring to bear the tradition, the insights, the methods, the theoretical self-awareness that exists in the Marxian tradition. And that's a loss for the country. That's a loss for the quality of debate. It's a loss for the quality of education. There is no justification for it. The Marxian tradition remains as it develops the richest repository of theoretical and practical efforts to go beyond capitalism that exist, not to know it, not to teach it, not to avail it to yourself as part of what you bring to social analysis weakens the society and weakens you. It's a tragedy that so many American universities still 
find themselves mired in the legacy of the Cold War, of the fetishism of mathematical approaches, and of the undoing of the social democracy of the 30s, that they still cannot recognize all that an evolving Marxist tradition offers. And so with that, you will perhaps understand why I appreciate your invitation as an opportunity to talk about this tradition and hope, as I do, that some of you in this room together today will be the ones who carry it the next step where it has to go. I've taken my 50 minutes, so let me stop there and turn it back over to Professor Mate and her very able, if young, assistant. Thank you, thank you, Richard, so much for this superb lecture, uh, really superb lecture that really puts its finger on the fact that any approach to knowledge is deeply political. There's some traditions that accept their political vocation, others that conceal it, but of course, the point here is that the Marxian tradition is a tradition that is intrinsically revolutionary for the fact that once you understand how capitalism works, you really understand that you need to transcend it. And I think Richard gave it an amazing explanation of why that is so. And his concluding remarks are wonderful because it really shows why we had the urge to even start this lecture series in the first place, to really start rebuilding, rethinking, renovating a tradition that has so much potential and that Richard Wolff is such an amazing exponent. Um, and so here I would like to give the word to our two excellent graduate students, uh, Yanni and Cesar. They will uh, discuss uh, with Richard and after that we will have the general Q&A. Thank you so much for your time here. So is it appropriate then for me to ask if I can pose my question to uh, Yanis? Of course, of course, with great joy. All right. Uh, here's the question, which we all worked out a little bit uh, beforehand. Uh, why and how is the notion of overdetermination important for contemporary social struggles? All right. Thank you very, very much for this very interesting lecture uh, and uh, also very I mean, in intriguing uh, question. So allow me to start with a short summary of what has been uh, discussed previously. I will try to be uh, fast in a sense. Uh, so to begin with, it is made clear that dialectal materialism is the distinct epistemological standpoint of Marxism, while uh, we discussed that historical materialism is the distinctive conception of society. For Marxism, this society, as, as we discussed here, is a complex totality of relationships, a multifaceted uh, interaction among and between uh, people and uh, nature. Then the question is how to analyze this very highly and complex totality? What is actually the basic unit of analysis? And I think that the answer provided here is that the basic unit is process. So the relations that constitute society are composed of a set of distinguishable processes that collide with each other. And if we want to, uh, roughly, uh, it's not possible, as we say, to have a concrete list of these different processes, we could actually summarize uh, this uh, process in the natural, the economic, the political, and the cultural. And what is important here is that these processes are not isolated. But in the also in the in the same time they can they are and they can be distinguishable, and I think the clarity over the differences of these four processes is important. But let me get more concrete. Let's take as example working as a fundamental relation uh, relationship of capitalist society. Of course, it would involve natural processes. So physical changes in the raw materials, one could think of chemical, biological, physical, and so forth. It would include also uh, an economic process or economic processes. 
specifically for capitalism, the performance and appropriation of surplus labor from different classes. And for Marxism, as I think it was obvious through the discussion, it's a class process that is fundamentally exploitative. We also have, and we must not forget, that there are political processes, a structure of command among the various participants uh, in the workplace. And last, I guess, but not least, there are some cultural processes, which of course conceptualize um, the social significance that the work has. And now if we dig a bit deeper and we kind of analyze and discuss the class process, what was discussed or what we could say as a fundamental, the production and appropriation of the surplus value, as well as the subsume, in a sense, the distribution of the surplus value. Of course, this part, process is far, uh, partly affected by a social acceptance of produced knowledge. It could be, for example, economic knowledge, which would then mean that there is no recognition over the existence of exploitation of the economic process. And now let's, uh, let's remind ourselves of neoclassical economics. The theory of distribution in the mainstream economics, the neoclassical economics, suggests that each individual is paid back its marginal contribution to the production. So the obvious differences that, I mean, are obvious uh, in income, again, can be traced back or reduced. This is the epistemological standpoint of neoclassical uh, economics. It's fundamentally reducing uh, the, the objects of analysis to the essential causes. And the essential cause would be human nature. In any, any case, though, it is important to say that at the end, no one can appropriate uh, any surplus because exactly there is no surplus, right? Uh, everybody gets what he or she contributes. And of course, uh, of course, exploitation disappears. And there can be many uh, similar ideas, not only of economic knowledge that are reproduced, also argued, but also get instilled early in our, in our life through, of course, household, it could be religion, media, and I would add as a student that we also have education, which is a very important way that this kind of cultural processes are instilled. And they remind, and we can remind ourselves uh, the words of Luel Tusser, who spoke about the silent concert. Wow. Anyway, the result of this may be that laborers are not conscious of their exploitation. For them, it's, as we discussed, partly non-existent. And of course, these highly complex cultural processes legitimize, in a sense, the nature of work performed. But in the same time, uh, the fundamental class process, the extraction of surplus and appropriation of surplus labor is also overdetermined by political process. And this is something that we also have to consider when analyzing uh, the fundamental class process. To extract surplus and appropriate uh, the surplus labor, a vertical, probably, mostly, a uh, vertical hierarchy is imposed within the firm with uh, clear order giving and rule enforcing. And I think that this combination pushes the worker to perform surplus labor. Or we could even think about a legal structure that again uh, enforces the worker to partake in the fundamental class process by ensuring that uh, any resistance uh, to this process would have legal uh, consequences. Last but not least, and this is something we also have to consider, and I believe it's a burning issue, is uh, the, uh, the discussion over the natural process, which of course are fundamental for ensuring the production and appropriation of surplus uh, value and surplus labor. Since of course, nature has undoubtedly, and this is something that Marx understood, shapes the way that value is created and appropriated. For example, uh, and using a Marxist, the Marxist political economy framework, a environmental pollution or the extensive use of less or more favorable natural resources may actually influence uh, the labor productivity and actually boost or impede uh, the surplus value extraction. Of course, as we discussed, all these processes are overdetermined or what we would say mutually constituted, but overdetermined in a contradictory way, right? So we, are, we discuss how the social relationships and process, the social relations are pushed and pulled in the different directions. To untangle this highly complex set of overdeterminations, Marx's theory has a clear starting point. And this starting point is a fundamental and subsumed class process. 
again, though, and that's very important and it's very distinctive of this kind of reading of Marxism, is that the epistemological position of Marxist theory is that the class process is not the essential cause of every other process we discussed. Each process has its own distinct importance and has quite different qualities. And of course, the fundamental and subsumed class process, again, the production, appropriation and distribution of surplus value is the way, and I want to make it clear that Marxism understands class struggle. As we discussed again, though, this class struggle is itself contradictory and overdetermined by other non-class processes. So <clears throat> I believe that the commitment to anti-essentialism and the notion of overdeterminism of a different social processes and natural process are very important implications of the way of organizing the various social struggles. Uh, one could think, for example, the fresh, they are very fresh actually, the successful struggles over unionization that I think in fact compel us to think the importance of social fights accounting for these different processes. Again, let's think of Amazon. Amazon didn't fundamentally challenge the conditions and the technology that uh, dictates the pace of work. Of course, arguing over and having a demand over wages and benefits. Hence, understanding, in the sense, the importance of the economic class process. And I think here, and I must, we must have it very clear in our mind, that the call for dignity in the workplace says something very, very fundamental about how the labor process is taking place under capitalism. Furthermore, though, through, the educating, through educating and allowing workers in the facility to openly reflect on their work experience, the union also tried to question the meaning attached to the nature of work performed. And we saw that some workers slowly transcended the notion of equal Amazon associates by commercialization, both of the essential and social character of their labor, as well as the existing exploitative work culture. Furthermore, the union addressed the diverse cultural background of the workers by approaching immigrants working the facility. Again, openly confronting issues of racial discrimination from higher management echelons. Lastly, I think that's also very important that the fight was also given over the issues relating to unequal power distribution and authority existing within the facility. The union against campaign against the existing authoritarian and punitive systems of uh, supervision, while of course it also exposed instances where power was exercised unevenly based on gender. To summarize then, I would suggest that the fact that the union questions even to some extent, the embedded what we could call common sense of these different processes. And also it's the trying, trying to shape a union addressing these class and non-class issues in a consistent way, we might fight, uh, fight explain its initial success. And of course, there are other examples that we could use. So to conclude and having said all that, then dialectical and historical materialism, the epistemological and methodological standpoint of Marxism is important for contemporary social struggles because I think it constructs a distinctive way of understanding, connecting and changing the different exploitative and authoritarian processes constituting this highly complex capitalist society. And I think that this new departure from Marxian theory and its commitment to anti-essentialism, denying again the substantial priority or causal primacy of any of the different processes rejects a rude economic determinism, but at the same time, it rejects the reverse condition of reducing everything to the effects of cultural or other political processes. Again, I believe that the importance uh, we are addressing here, and it is addressed that we should not dismiss the endurance and the importance of the class process of creation, appropriation, and distribution of surplus value. Thus, the notion of overdeterminism allows. I believe, and I would suggest that social struggles um, can uh, reconnect with the class process by not dismissing or reducing other non-class aspects and processes. Essentially, and I'm ending with that, it opens a specific way of reconceptualizing both in theoretical, but also in practical terms, 
the possible alliances uh, that can exist between the working class and other social movements for transcending what we call also in this lecture series, the systematic failure of contemporary capitalism by overthrowing the system itself. I think that's my not so brief, <laughs> eventually, uh, answer to your question, Professor. And I'm, of course, I'm open to if you have any thoughts on that. It's quite a lengthy answer. Though. Yeah, a couple before I ask the second question, just, just a couple of comments. Um, you might enjoy using concrete examples. Think of a worker who goes in every day to the factory, the office, or the store, and there sees an immense collection of what is called loosely capital, the building, the machinery, the vehicles, the computers, all, all of it, and marvels, and is told by the employer, as by the teacher, you bring labor and you get wages. But look at all that the capitalist brings, all those machines, all that building, all that equipment. And that's why they get profits. And in the mind of the worker, whether he or she is aware of it or not, there's always a question. And we can bring that question to the fore. You know that that computer was built by a worker like you. And the building was built by workers like you. So the really interesting question isn't answered by the capitalist. Because what the capitalist is telling you is, I got my hands on the fruits of the labor of workers like you, and I'm using that fact to get more. And you know what it is? It's a hustle. It's a game. You're being ripped off. This is understandable, but you need then in that act, you demystify the neoclassical, you know, the marginal product of capital as opposed to the marginal product of labor or whatever form of that argument, you know, Euler's theorem, and all the things that I assume you learned early, early on that you had to go through. The, these kinds of examples can go very far in opening the space for workers then to get to more abstract formulation of the argument. Second, if class is overdetermined by everything else and participates, then we as Marxists have to explain why we focus on class. Class doesn't shape society more than how you eat or how you dance or how you dress or how you pray or everything else. The reason we focus on it therefore is not because it's the determining variable. We haven't figured out which variables go uh, on the right-hand side of the equation to explain the dependent one. To call some dependent and some independent is a hustle. It's, a, it's as if you know that when you can't. But our answer has to be, we focus on class, not because it's any more important than anything else. It's because other people have been afraid to, other people have refused to, a whole tradition pretends nothing's there. That's why we wanna put it back into the analytical conversation, but we don't need, because of our epistemology, to make spurious claims that it's the most important, They're not necessary. Nobody has the most important. There is, there is no such thing, you know, and, and therefore you, we can attack you because you make that claim. You can't attack us. We don't make, uh, we don't make the claim. And, and the last thing I, I, I thought of as you were, as you were talking, I didn't have the time, and I'm glad you did, to talk about process, that everything is a process. Here's what that means. Everything is changing. That's really what the word process means, because a process has a beginning and an end, and things have changed between those moments, the begin moment, the end moment. And by calling everything a process, you are making 
an epistemological and ontological claim. The world is constantly changing and your theory of it is recognizing that and also changing. And that is a very powerful way to differentiate Marxism from, for example, neoclassical or any other conservative ideology. For them, change is terrifying. If capitalism is always changing, then it too can die. They, don't, they may not be conscious, but this is a frightening... Uh, try, try to think of it this way. If a human being comes to an end, it's terrifying. That's why we have thousands of years of human beings desperately telling stories about how life will go on. They will go to heaven. They will go with the ancestor. They will meet, re-meet their mother. All the urgent things of life become invested in a rejection of everything changing. This, this is crucial. And, and it becomes very powerful politically once it is marshaled. There is no, and let me, I'll push you. There is no Donald Trump. There is no Donald Trump without the desperate desire of a destroyed middle class that does not want to believe that the phase of US capitalism that gave them, because of the left, a middle class life from the 30s to the 80s, they don't want to believe that's over. The, the, no, no, no. We can bring it, we can make America great again. We can bring back, we can stop the process. These are deep political impulses, and how you deal with them will shape your political success or not. All right, let me turn next. I'm sorry I took so long uh, to Cesar. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> and I, let me ask you the question How does the choice over different contending economic theories mutually constitute the different societal institutions? Sort of how do you connect the warfare among neoclassical Keynesian and Marxian economics on the one hand with the society in which that warfare is going on on the other? Okay. Well, thank you so much for the question and, and thank you for the commentaries actually that uh, you made about the concept of process. I think that for tackling tackling this this the second question, it's interesting to figure out the epistemological change of uh, this specific Martian perspective that you share uh, in order to grasp uh, these different uh, social and economic objects that we have when we are doing either classical political, eco classical political economy or economics or the way that we uh, try to use for understand the main uh, objectives of our discipline. I think that uh, in this case, uh, institutions uh, approach it from the perspective of uh, this new departure of the Marxist political economy uh, are uh, basically uh, 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 grasped as uh, these entangles of ideas and actions or ideas and practices. And in this way, I think that uh, it's very important to uh, recast again the concept of overdeterminism. In contrast to the neoclassical theory, Marxian theory understands that uh, the political economy is framed by different uh, objects who are not, who are, sorry, who are causing at the same time one and the other. Right. Says that we are moving uh, through, again, the actions of specific actors uh, involved in the design of specific institutions, says the uh, working place, but also the political economy in the state, or uh, even uh, in the uh, context of uh, the high ed institutions, the ideas that are sharing in the economics departments. So in this way, overdeterminism uh, is useful for understand that we are talking about networks of different objects and subjects interacting between each other. So this is a kind of more abstract way to understand it. But uh, when we move again to the practical issues, we uh, try to, uh, 
conceive that the social reality is uh, basically framed between, uh, by the uh, academic work that these economists uh, framing in these different traditions are uh, sharing with the public and the way that the public says uh, workers in the again the in the in the shop floor or uh, any citizen uh, uh, influenced by mass media uh, get into account uh, why am why I am starting with this point because I also was really interested by the first uh, commentary that Clara Matei did at the beginning of the talk that for Gramsci, action is thought and thought is action. And I think that also this is a nice quotation for understanding this new perspective on uh, the networking of different social objects that we are uh, uh, that we are trying to understand through the lens of this uh, new perspective on Martian political economy. In that way, uh, the again the new epistemological perspective on over determinism. Uh, uh, allows us, able us to understand the different uh, theories on uh, economics uh, in three parts, if we can tell that entry points, objects, and logic. What is an entry point? An entry point, it's not an element of causation and as the, again, the typical uh, essential position in epistemology uh, grasp uh, the way of doing theory. Entry points are basically, as the name says, starting points for trying to make explanations, but those are every time, uh, or those de depend on the specific historical experience of the actors uh, uh, designing these specific econ economic theories. So uh, in contrast to the, Mar to the Marxist political economy, neoclassical economics uses three elements as entry points. So they use endowments, they use a basic idea of the human nature related with the, sub with the specific uh, individualism or subjectivism. And in the third point, they use this idea of technology in that way, uh, they try to reduce the whole economic experience and the whole understanding of the uh, uh, social and economic institutions uh, uh, based on these three elements. So again, the idea is that these three entry points or these three elements uh, uh, give the whole, give a whole explanation of what is happening in the different spheres of society. In contrast, again, the, the, the Martian political economy uses as entry point the concept of class. And we were discussing about this not only because of methodological issues by its own, but also because the uh, historical experience related with the different practices and interactions of actors from different social classes in the capitalist economy uh, are uh, framed by the realities of class struggle. Right. So this is the this is one important uh, uh, epistemological distinction. So after this, after grasping these starting points, I think that if we move to more concrete uh, examples, as for instance the way that uh, neoliberal capitalism frame institutions, we understand uh, the reality of these specific uh, different theoretical points of departure. Uh, for instance, when uh, neoliberal policymakers try to design a specific way of doing macroeconomic policy by means of application of austerity or by means of application of social policy, which doesn't mean to redistribute value, but to reallocate the surplus value already uh, uh, extracted from the workers, they are thinking at two basic entry points, says the idea of human nature uh, based again in this individual as isolated from the society and the idea of competition, uh, frame it, uh, framing in that way the whole uh, uh, social actors as tiny pieces of capital competing between each other and which, which are going to be, who are going to be uh, basically sustained in terms of uh, the uh, strength of human capital. So in this case, they try to reframe the understanding of how do the uh, prices should be uh, uh, 
the uh, theoretically uh, approach it in the uh, in, in, in economics says that uh, free market prices or price or, comp or prices of in a in a in a in an image of the markets as a perfect competitive competitive market the idea that income is going to be redistributed in terms of the uh, uh, way uh, of uh, uh, depending on the productivity of each uh, productive factor and that the growth is going to depend on the uh, good uh, or this or, or the stability of this uh, uh, interaction between prices, uh, factors of production, and institutions maintaining again the uh, principle of competition, and in this way they reduce uh, uh, the uh, re the economic reality to a certain uh, image of a machine, which is which uh, needs to be uh, basically commanded by the ideas of technocrats and policy makers exactly. who are who have got, who grasp this uh, from a certainly superior uh, epistemological uh, position the uh, economic practices that the workers cannot as assumably uh, grasp uh, directly in that way they are framing or mis mistaken what are the real necessities of the of the of the of the of the uh, of, of, of the workers and uh, of the citizens as a whole? Uh, in, uh, I think that uh, this uh, specific, uh, or if we try to criticize, if we are uh, up to uh, pro propose different criticisms to this uh, neoclassical perspective, we move again. To a basic a specific change in the kind of uh, epistemological approach that we are going to use for grasping these institutions, especially to tackle down a different process based on this neoclassical understanding of the institutions that led uh, different, for instance, different uh, social policies to be commodified, says that to be privatized or uh, taken out from the uh, democratic deliberation uh, uh, from the bottom of the uh, uh, of the society said that the democratic deliberation represented the collective the collective process of decision making uh, by the uh, uh, workers and by other uh, uh, social movements involved in the criticism of capitalism uh, by Finally, by saying that, I would uh, suggest or would uh, uh, try to uh, raise this other element of uh, this new perspective or these new departures in Martian political economy invite us, invite us also on thinking about how to construct alternatives uh, to, the, to the current uh, capitalist institutional setup. So uh, I know that Professor Wolf has a very uh, a huge work on the alternatives of cooperativism, but also uh, let's try to talk about new ways of redistributing wealth or the aggregate value produced beyond the simply uh, redistribution of the already extracted surplus value that could be uh, be a new way to uh, get emancipation for uh, the uh, labor class in this uh, contemporary capitalism uh, setup. All right, let me make a couple of comments and then I, if I understand, we'll open up to more general uh, questions. Um, there's a famous artist, woman artist, who made a remark once that I think might summarize this for you as well. We don't, she spoke about human beings. Human beings don't see the world as it is. Human beings see the world as they are. In other words, how we look at the world always shapes whatever it is we think we find in the world. In physics, they had to learn it with the Heisenberg principle. That when you look through a telescope at the heavens, what you see depends on the construction of that telescope as much as on anything else. And you should never forget it. I think there's a kind, if I could say it, I go back to my example of Janet Yellen. Janet Yellen, because I know what her education was since it was identical to mine, knows 
what causes an inflation, just as I do. And she knows what's at stake in coming up with an anti-inflationary policy. I'm going to tell you what it is in a minute, but she never says a word. She never, and I don't believe she's a dishonest person from what I remember. She's not. But ideology works this way. So let's begin. What causes an inflation? Well, only employers set prices. So if there's a general increase in prices, that's what we mean by inflation, it's because employers, capitalists, have chosen to raise prices. Capitalists are less than 1% of the population. 99% of the people have to pay prices set by 1%. This will bother people when they understand it. If you present inflation as the result of all these complex causes, you know what you're doing? You're removing who gets the blame. But who gets the blame is an argument we have, very good for us. Don't give it away. A tiny minority that sits at the top of our capitalist system sets the prices. They raise them. We have an inflation. Now, step two. What do we do about the inflation? Answer, we raise interest rates. But of course, that's not the answer. That's one answer. You can do that. But Janet Yellen knows that in 1971, Richard Nixon used a wage price freeze to stop an inflation. There is no discussion in the United States of a wage price freeze. In the early 1940s, the President Roosevelt closed the market and used a rationing system. He printed books that had ration stamps in it, and Americans who wanted to buy meat or coffee or a gallon of gasoline for their car had to use a ration stamp, and that was handed out to people to each according to their need, which, if you're a Marxist, should sound familiar. So we haven't relied on interest rate increases. What you have now is a desperate system that cannot identify the causes of inflation because it's too dangerous. So it makes things up like supply chain interruptions, which is crazy stuff. And it can't have a conversation about anti-inflationary uh, policies because it's too dangerous. They have to act and talk, even though they know better, as though raising interest rates is the only thing the Federal Reserve can do, no matter what its consequences, no matter who it's hurt. And then here comes the ultimate. Fed Chair Powell and Janet Yellen and people like that announce their distress that with the coming recession, it will be unemployed people who suffer the pain of solving the inflation crisis, which obviously they didn't cause. And they say this without any recognition of what they are saying. All the distributional elements, all the notions of the most elementary justice out the window. Their ideology, they are like people in very poor countries who are rich. And as they go out of their home, they step over the dead bodies in the street and they don't see them anymore. There are no people there. And you ask them, how do you feel about those people? And they look at you and they didn't notice anymore. The power of of ideology is wrapped up in economics, teaching people that the interest rates go up. And, and now we should discuss how much will they go up? Three quarters of a That's not relevant. What's relevant is the absurdity of a conversation in a country that has used wage price freeze and rationing that acts as if it never had the history. I mean, it, 
you, you, this is called in, in, in medicine, this is pathology. Th these are people who are seriously disturbed. And I think economics is a place where this is becoming more and more obvious. And that that too is a sign. Look how desperate these theories are to hold on to the system that they have to violate even their own rules of procedure or honesty or discussion. It's remarkable. It's really remarkable. Okay. Um, to whom do yes. I turn it over for the question? Yes. Now I will take the lead. Uh, oh. And I think it's about time for questions from the audience that uh, is, I mean, probably watching from the sub uh, webinar, also from YouTube live stream. Let's not forget about that. There are some people over there as well. And the first question, Professor, comes from Mehmet. And uh, Mehmet uh, is, comes from the Durham University in the United Kingdom. And the question goes like this. Given the importance of transdisciplinary methodology to approach the complex everyday problems, how should we understand the Marxian economic determinism? Is it not in contradiction, Mehmet asks, to Hegelian philosophy of knowledge? Yes. Um, thank you for the question. If you read the book, if, which I urge you to do, Knowledge in Class, you will know that much of the first part of that book is a critique of economic determinism. And it uses Hegel and a whole lot of other uh, resources uh, to make that critique. Economic determinism was and remains a very important reading of the Marxian tradition. But I caution you to be aware that economic determinism is also a major reading of almost every other social science tradition. It is this, it's a fundamentally an epistemological question. You're looking for the key cause. You want to organize the world because you think that's what thought is about, to identify what's the cause and what's the effect, and then to explain how the cause works its effects. If that's what you think thought is, if that's what you're rewarded for, if when you were a graduate student, you were told you had written an excellent paper when you showed that the key cause of something is this, then that's the way you're going to think. And you're going to think that whether you're presented with Marxian literature or any other literature, because for you, your epistemology presumes a cause and an effect. And if you're an economist, you become tempted, because it's your profession, to make the economics the dominant cause, because that's what you're a specialist in. It's a way of, of celebrating yourself. I'm very important, because I, I don't just study economics, but economics is the foundation, is the base, is the cause, is the ultimate, is the end, final cause of it all. So economists have a special attraction to economic determinism uh, because it's a, a mode of self-aggrandizement. But beside that, they can feed into the larger tradition that thinks cause and effect is the way uh, to conceptualize. Overdeterminist Marxism, if you allow me, is the attempt to break out of the dominance of economic determinism as a reading of Marx, which you had in the 19th and 20th century for much of it, much of the kind of Marxism that was developed was based on an economic determinist reading. And for some of you, you might get the irony. Nothing was more important in disseminating the determinist reading then the decision by the leaders of the Soviet Union, above all, Joseph Stalin, to translate the works of Marx, Lenin, and himself, Stalin, into every language on the face of this earth. They distributed the writings of the great leaders 
but they also produced their own interpretations of those writings. If you ever saw in the 60s and 70s, if you travel, as I did, I traveled because of the rest of my life, I spent time in East Africa, in Zanzibar, Tanzania, Uganda, and Kenya. And I discovered all over the place, English, but also Swahili versions of what were called the textbook of Marxism, Leninism, produced in the Soviet Union. That's what young people interested in Marxism were reading. And that was a very systematic, economic determinist kind of reading. There were always critics of economic determinism. Marx himself and, and Engels are famous for comments they made dissociating themselves from economic determinism. But, you know, that's only one influence if the textbooks that are spread around the world are giving you that. Uh, well, then you're going to go that way. And I think that battle is not over. So Mehmet's question is absolutely appropriate. That interpretation remains powerful, as does economic determinism everywhere else in modern capitalism. The American working class family gathering for dinner will hear father say something like, in the end, it's the almighty dollar that makes the world the way it is. That's economic determinism. People grow up with it. It's, it's in the daily bread. Uh, and it's going to be a struggle to get beyond that, which is one of the reasons philosophy and epistemology have to be part of what Marxism is. Thank you for the answer, Professor Wolf. The second question comes from John, and it says, "Could you get uh, for us more in detail? Uh, could you get more in detail about the relationship between Martian economics and the Freudian perspectives on psychoanalysis?" Sure. Um, there is a literature, by the way. There is an important literature that explores all of that. So I'm going to give you an answer. But if you are interested, there have been, particularly in the last 30 to 40 years, an enormous array of Marxists who have investigated the relevance, the appropriateness, the relationship between Freud's work and Marx's work. Uh, and there are people coming from the other side, from the medical, psychological side that have become interested in Marxism. So there is... Um, uh, a history. There's a journal which I look at called the Journal of Psychohistory. Um, if you look at that, there's a, there's a clearly a Marxian uh, influence um, there. And you know, as Freud became more and more important across the 20th century uh, in people's thinking, the overlap between what he had to say and what Marxism also became its its own um, what should I call it scholarly interest. Well, there's a lot of literature. In short, there's a lot of literature. Here's my basic response. Marx was interested in understanding the social, how the different parts of the thing we call society interact. How does the economic interact with the political? How does this the call Marx was very interested in that all the time. He felt that the economic was particularly under, under analyzed, poorly understood, and ideologically horrible. So it was what attracted him. I just want to remind you all, Marx was not originally an economist. He was a student of philosophy. He got his uh, degree in philosophy and he got his first job as a professor of philosophy. So he came into economics through philosophy and through public struggle. He got involved with workers' struggles. Um, nowadays, something like this goes on. The problems with Freud that have been identified have a lot to do with where Freud's limits are where Freud doesn't explore how the economic and political outside impact on the psychology of the individual. 
And when he did venture there, it was pretty mechanical and needs a lot more work. I mean, to be crude, uh, the critique of Freud was he didn't know much about Marx. Uh, and the critique of Marx, by the way, coming from the other side, is that Marx had no grasp, for example, of the notion that there are two levels of consciousness, what we are conscious of and what's going on in our brains that we are not conscious of those feelings and reactions and desires and dreams and hopes that only periodically poke through and that need a whole analytical activity to become a little bit clearer about. You can, you can analyze your dreams. That was his first book. Here's how you do it. Here's what you will discover. You can analyze your slips, what we nowadays call Freudian slips or your jokes he has a whole apparatus of how to analyze but it, when when he does that he is showing us for i mean let me give you an example from bourgeois economics if you understand anything about freud you can't draw an indifference curve because even if it's an accurate representation of what you're conscious of it can't possibly capture what you're unconscious of and when you choose between a banana and a and a handkerchief on your, uh, your indifference curve, the impact of all of the unconscious meanings that handkerchief and orange have for you are absent. And you're going to get a regularity of a demand or a supply curve, which ignores what Freud knows is going on. That's why when I go into the supermarket, one day I pick uh, uh, an orange over an apple and the next day I don't. This is not the instability of our preferences. It's because of the ha -ha, contradictions within our conscious, within our unconscious, and in the relationship between the two. All of that is, is gone. And, and there are projects of people who try to bring them into uh, closer. And you know, this goes, but this is not new. Uh, one of the great attempts early on, uh, before Freud in not, theory was all that well known, was the odd, he was odd, but he was also very, very theoretically um, original, was Wilhelm Reich in, in Germany, uh, who tried to understand as a communist, which is what he was, as a member of the Communist Party in Germany, what the appeal was of Adolf Hitler. He tried to understand the appeal to young Germans of fascism as a Marxist trying to understand what he foresaw would be a serious threat. I mean, he didn't understand how serious it, it ended up being, but so, so there have long been periods like that. Uh, I believe Yanis mentioned the, the 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 French Marxist Althusser. Althusser was a very close student of the psychological literature. Uh, Althusser was a close friend of Derrida. Althusser is wrapped up with the psychological school that interpreted postmodernism in their way. All of that stuff has now percolated in uh, to Marxism. And so there is a lively back and forth, but they belong together. The, the, the critical analysis of the society and the critical analysis of the human psychology as it struggles within that society belong together. They are, they should be teaching each other to get a richer sense of what's going on and how to intervene um, in the process. Professor, there, are, there is, I mean, we're overwhelmed by very interesting questions coming from all around the world. Good. Uh, but I think we have enough time for one more, unfortunately. Uh, the, um, there is a question here from Will. Uh, that's a very, the, he has, uh, I think it's a very interesting question. The question goes as this, do we have enough time? Do we have the time to keep experimenting a la China, Chiapas, Bolivia, Rojava, Etc. Is there any way to Slavoj Zizek's don't act, just think? 
only acting when we are absolutely sure about our methods? I think that's one very interesting last question before we leave. I, I don't see the choice. We have no choice. We have to think, we have to act. Thinking shapes our acting, acting shapes our thinking. It has always been that way. I don't even, I can't really imagine how we could do otherwise. Uh, if I can draw on my own life, I feel if I've been able to do anything theoretically, it's because of my activism. My activism was crucial to helping me sort out issues which I think otherwise I would have spent my life Early on in my life, I wrote essays on Marx's transformation problem because I used to do mathematics. I, I know how to do all that. And, and so I, I worked on prices and values and, and you know, all, all of that literature, which, by the way, is an immense body of literature over 100 years that many of the great illuminaries of Marxism. Before I decided this is not the work. I, I love theoretical work. I believe in it. I do it, but I need it balanced with trying concretely to come up with answers, to confront workers that are irritated by what I say and want to get to the next point. I want something concrete. Uh, yeah, sometimes that irritation on their part is misplaced. At other times, it's a godsend. It opens up understandings for me that I've never had. So for me, I. I don't know if there's enough time. I, I never know the answer to that question, but it's going to take time and it's going to take efforts. Look, let me give you a simple example. I now, my radio, you mentioned it, but, uh, Professor Matei was very kind about it. I do this radio program once a week for half an hour. It's called Economic Update. It's now reaching millions, tens of millions of people. It's a weekly critique of capitalism. I'm not sure that has ever happened in the United States before. In other words, the technology wasn't there before. The audience interest wasn't there before. People like me that can fill that interest, at least to a, some extent, weren't eager to do that or willing to do that or able to do it. Uh, things have come together in a remarkable way that make that now possible. Um, I wouldn't have known that by thinking about it. You have to go out and try and do it. And then you discover, whoa, it is possible. It is. In 1988, at the height of the Cold War, a group of us at the University of Massachusetts launched a magazine called Rethinking Marxism. Everybody we asked thought we could not have chosen a worse time in modern history to try to launch a new Marxian magazine. It worked. It's been publishing every quarter from 1988 to right now. So turned out, if you try, I'm not arguing that it couldn't have failed. It could have. But there has to be this, this back and forth. We you cannot know the working class and where it is and what it's willing to do until you try. Nobody knew that after the pandemic, we would have millions of workers quitting their jobs. No one knew that would be an explosion of unionization efforts. No one knew there would be an explosion of uh, strikes. And no one knew that a whole new generation of students like you would be inspired and encouraged to, to go further into Marxism because it was happening. You know, I went through the 1990s, 80s and 90s, when people who had said they were Marxists stopped because it was hard. Everybody thought it was over. The Soviet Union had taken the whole left tradition down with it. And that, to you know, I won't quote you by name, but you know, there were all kinds of people who advised me to, to change my affiliation because it would do my career no good, et cetera. I didn't do that. And now like an old tie, it has come back in to fashion. And so you know, I'm enjoying it. I don't deny it for a minute, but I think you have to, 
you can't ask those kinds of questions. Or if you do, you have to answer, we have to do both and we have to be open. Conditions will change, which is the more. You know, when, when Mussolini puts Gramsci in jail, he becomes a theorist, right? What is he going to do? He's in jail. I, that much I understand. But if you're not forced, then I think you you need to be open to both. Okay, I think uh, we will pass to Professor Matei for, for the ending of this uh, interesting lecture. And thank you very much. Yes, sorry. I would also like to add that, in fact, Gramsci in jail was, became a theorist because he had worked for so many years as the leader of L'Ordine Nuovo in Turin, which was an activist group that was directly in the workplaces with the factory councils. So he wouldn't have had all that knowledge without uh, his uh, practical work. So thank you, Richard, for this amazingly inspiring uh, class. It was more than a class, it was a great conversation. Uh, Cesar and Yanni were fantastic. So I think we're really uh, starting this uh, lecture series on a super positive note. Let's hope that the other classes will keep up the level. And um, uh, just, I would like to really thank all the work that is being done in the, let's say, in the back rooms by Hanin and Huani, who have been really working so hard for this, uh, like the main organizer of our small collective for this course. So thank you. And uh, wanted also to remind you that the next class is going to be on the 7th of November with Duncan Foley on production. And I also encourage everyone to share the registration link so that you can get the information needed to prepare for class. Uh, Richard has shared with us some prelim preliminary readings, uh, a bunch of his uh, works, both theoretical and more activist-like. So please also take the time to go back and after this class, look at the material. And uh, hopefully you'll also receive the new one for Duncan's class. Thank you everyone for attending. Have a Thank great you. day. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.